The Fast and the Furious not only defies physics, but also the conventional wisdom of film franchises. Starting off as uninspired B-movies, then evolving into crowd-pleasing blockbusters. But still B-movies. Universal Pictures assembled not just a crack team, but a supportive and collaborative family. But like any family road trip, it was full of speed bumps and squabbling siblings. From overbearing egos to sudden tragedies, the Fast Saga was built a quarter mile at a time, and each mile marker was a shit show. Around the year 2000, deceptively powerful import cars naturally became popular with illegal drag racing. The scene blew up enough that whole news stories and articles were dedicated to this dangerous and sometimes lethal sport. One such piece, Racer X and Vibe Magazine, inspired producer Neil Moritz to develop it into a movie. He had just finished producing The Skulls, and he, Paul Walker, and director Rob Cohen wanted to work together again. Moritz quickly commissioned a script, attaching both Walker and Cohen. Universal Pictures told Moritz that if he got Timothy Oliphant to play the anti-hero Dominic Toretto, the film would be greenlit on the spot. Oliphant passed. Moritz's second choice was the upcoming Vin Diesel. Universal was actually okay with the idea, as he starred in their sleeper hit Pitch Black that same year. So they said, we got this movie, and we want you to play this character, Dom, who's a tough guy, outlaw, with a heart and a code. And then they described that scene that you see in the first movie, where the camera goes through my eye and down my arm and into the engine. And I said, yes, I'm in. Then he read the script. Set in New York, the first draft was lackluster, slow, and featured an all-white cast. Hardly the image one would conjure reading Racer X's multicultural racing scene. Universal hired David Ayer for the rewrite. He personally reached out to Diesel to go through the script page by page to craft a better story with a more ethnically diverse set of characters that reflected the cities they grew up in. Ayers did the same for Michelle Rodriguez and Jordana Brewster once they came aboard, as their roles were extremely one note. These were the first moments that would continue to define the soon-to-be mega franchise as one of collaboration and diversity in all avenues. Before filming started up, Diesel and Walker attended an actual street race for research. The police helicopters arrived and they fled. Giggling down an alleyway, a lifelong friendship was born. For Diesel, who has a blonde-haired, blue-eyed twin brother named Paul, it felt like he had gained another sibling. Production of Redline went mostly under the radar. The cast would call in friends to be extras, real drag racers showed up to get their cars featured, and a lot of the time it was like a party. The only real problem they ran into was the title. Racer X or Race Wars, Race Wars were not great. They liked The Fast and the Furious, but Roger Corman already held the rights with his film from 1954. Corman, though, willingly gave them the name in exchange for some of Universal's unused stock footage. The Fast and the Furious released on June 22, 2001. While it looked cool at the time and was a star-making role for Vin Diesel, it's generally considered a cheesier, pale imitation of Point Break. But it didn't matter. As a teen-oriented flick, it far outperformed Universal's expectations. A sequel was immediately ordered. Universal rushed out another script. Diesel felt making a sequel would undermine the possibility of the original becoming an all-time classic. And if he were to do one, it needed to evolve the mythology of Dom, Brian O'Connor, and their universe. This script wasn't that. It was a tangentially related sequel, very common in the 90s and early aughts. Diesel turned down 20 million to star, alternatively choosing to produce a follow-up to Pitch Black, The Chronicles of Riddick, which one could argue had too much mythology. Singer model Tyrese Gibson was brought on as a pseudo-Dom replacement. Without Diesel, Rob Cohen also walked. Per Tyrese's suggestion, Universal hired Boys in the Hood director John Singleton. Singleton asked Ja Rule to return, but he demanded an absurd 30 million. Singleton laughed in his face, moving on to fellow rapper Chris Ludacris Bridges. Too Fast, Too Furious arrived June 6, 2003. It opened big and made slightly more than the first. But reviews weren't nearly as kind, calling it a brainless, neon joyride. However, it did establish the series' fondness for hilariously nonsensical titles. In 2005, Universal held an open call for screenwriters to pitch ideas for a third film. Series fan Chris Morgan pitched a return of Dominic Toretto. 
they were going to do a third Fast and Furious movie, but it was $10 million straight to DVD. That's what they were looking to do. And then I was just young and didn't really know what I was doing, and I kind of came in and pitched. Okay, what if they bring back Dominic Toretto and someone in Japan gets killed? They're doing this thing in Japan. Look at this. These are things called drifting. Look at this video. This is a dragon run down a mountain. It's so cool. Dom has to go and he's got to learn a new style of racing. He's got to figure out wrong side of the road and how to drift to fit in to solve the crime of figure out who killed the person that he cares about. Since Diesel wasn't coming back and the franchise was really aimed squarely at 18-year-old boys, Universal wanted the script aged down to high schoolers. To direct, Neil Moritz saw Justin Lin's Better Luck Tomorrow about four Asian American teenagers who unintentionally start a criminal organization and thought Lin was the perfect choice. Lin refused. He found the script racist and dated. Universal was listening and had Lin sit with Morgan and revise everything to his liking. Lin also asked for a full colorblind casting process, hoping to get Sung Kang as the protagonist. But Universal said there was no Asian star bankable enough to draw audiences they forced Lin to cast Lucas Black, which actually gave Lin the freedom to fill out the rest of the cast unopposed. So he still picked Kang, renamed his character Han, the same name Kang had in Better Luck Tomorrow, and secretly retconned Lin's own indie film as a prequel to the Fast and the Furious franchise. Filming was a bit troubling. Tokyo wouldn't allow any shooting permits, requiring the production to close off six blocks of downtown LA and redress it head to toe as the famous Shibuya district. Anything actually filmed in Tokyo was illegally shot guerrilla style. When the cops eventually showed up, Universal hired a fall guy to pretend they were the director, who spent a night in jail. The rest was all CG. Throughout, Lin was constantly handpecked by the studio on every decision, seeing him as a rookie. Yet Lin was a gifted negotiator, standing his ground at each turn. Once done, test audience scores were bad. Universal arranged for Lin to have lunch with Vin Diesel and talk him into a cameo. Lin and Diesel bonded right from the start, both being fans of Dungeons and Dragons. They discussed for hours about how the Fast series should have its own mythology, where each installment evolves the formula, which is what Diesel attempted with the Chronicles of Riddick an overindulgent bomb that Universal had no desire to continue. Diesel agreed to the walk-on role, free of charge, if they gave him the rights to Riddick. Universal agreed, sweetening the deal by making him producer on a theoretical fourth Fast film. The Fast and the Furious, Tokyo Drift, spun out on June 16, 2006. The stunts were impressive and Han became a fan favorite, but with none of the original cast and dreadful reviews, it grossed far less than the previous two. It was ironically beaten by the second weekend of Cars, and the Dom Stinger did very little to move the needle. Fast was showing all the signs of a franchise out of gas. This is 2007, and we stopped at Arby's, and um, all of a sudden these kids saw Sung, and they're like, Han! And next thing I know, it was like, he's being like, swarmed by all these kids. Wow. And I, I just, I, it was the first time feeling that kind of impact. And I said, God, it's too bad Han is, uh, is dead. And then and Sun looked at me and said, does it have to be though? And I was like, oh, this is like everything I was talking to Vin about, the connection we could actually now see and we create our own timeline and mythology. And that was, that was the beginning of Fast 4. Justin Lin met with Vin Diesel and Chris Morgan. They decided that to build out Fast's so-called mythology, they needed to weave all the previous films together and forge a path forward. Bringing back Han, who died in Tokyo Drift, was a big fight with Universal. They feared audience confusion, as the timeline was being rewritten for a single actor. And to be fair... Uh, to be fair... To be fair... Well, to be fair... Ask any fan that has explained it to others, it does get a little convoluted. Again, Lin was able to get the studio to trust him. Paul Walker was done with the series, but the second Diesel said he was producing, Walker jumped in without batting an eye. Morgan abandoned his solo Dom storyline, and the team mapped out a new trilogy. The first installment would be a soft reboot, hence the confusingly similar title, Fast and Furious. They were so full of ideas, they wanted to make four and five back to back. Universal was in need of a cash printing franchise, but they weren't willing to commit that much. Production started in 2008, but because of the writer's strike, Morgan wasn't able to hand the crew a finished draft. Several planned sequences were thrown out, like cars towing a vault and one bursting through the nose of a plane. They all plowed through it, but this wasn't the revival film they truly wanted to make. Fast and Furious fired up on April 3rd, 2009, 
after a heavy ad campaign stressing the return of Diesel, Walker, and the rest of the family. Despite it being gauged as the forgettable one, with the lowest reviews of the series, the recoupling of the original cast was enough for fans. It hauled in almost twice as much as the first, with most of that coming from international audiences. Perhaps there was fuel left in the tank after all. The Fast and the Furious needed to evolve. The last film was the highest grossing, but worst reviewed. Lynn, Diesel, and Morgan determined they had a winning team, but not a winning formula. They realized that the series' street racing roots were limiting their creativity and governing how many new fans they could reach. Making Fast Five was a deliberate attempt to move from fanatic car culture to pure action adventure. To prove they weren't kidding around, Lynn took every effort to film all the action scenes practically and only relied on CGI when it was too dangerous. The spectacular vault heist alone made even the harshest of skeptics take notice. And it was just as insane to film as it was to watch. We brought the vault out of this underground parking garage and we were just guessing as to where that thing would tumble. But that is a real 9,000 pound vault tumbling across all of these cement posts that we put in. We pulled another vault that we had a hidden pickup truck inside the vault. We didn't know it was gonna be 190 degrees in there. So the stunt guy that was in there started passing out on us. Our third vault, it's just the semi truck tractor. It hit all these parked cars and crushed them. But then we got bored with it and cut some of the cars up so that they crushed a little easier. And then we had our tiniest stunt guy running this at the car in the cable and ducking down at the last second. We wrecked somewhere between 190 and 210 cars. We have to go out there and rehearse each and every bit of action to make sure that it's safe for the crew and then safe for the stunt people and the actors. That's the part that nobody really sees. And I think that's what really makes the difference is to put the audience in the seat with you and then they feel like they're a part of it. And that's what makes it exciting and entertaining. Production was saving millions by shooting in Puerto Rico rather than actual Brazil. But the vault sequence was so costly, Universal cut their budget for the Rio Favela chase. Instead of six days, Lynn pulled it off in a day and a half. At this point, Diesel was outsourcing ideas from his Facebook followers. The fan outcry of Letty's death from Fast 4 led to the post credit scene fake out. Agent Luke Hobbs was meant to be a Tommy Lee Jones type, but fans overwhelmingly yearned for Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Now with two human muscle cars, they had to drag it out and through every possible wall. <laughs> that said, as much as he presents himself as a man of the people, Vin Diesel is not above Hollywood pettiness. He harbored some resentment towards Tyrese for taking his place on Too Fast, Too Furious and didn't want to bring him back. Heard about you. It took Paul Walker, the always affable peacekeeper, to convince him to welcome Tyrese into the family. Fast Five rolled into theaters on April 29, 2011. Lo and behold, the combination of real stunts, genuine thrills, and The Rock's star power towed in over 600 million worldwide. It achieved the series' best reviews by far, something nigh unheard of for a fifth installment and is now seen as a legitimate action classic. Having nailed their formula, Lynn, Diesel, and Morgan were certainly not going to quit while they were ahead. They leaned into the idea that the characters' superpowers were their cars, and it was time to kick things into overdrive. The Fast Six shoot went well, though that isn't to say it was easy. The stellar tank chase was originally going to be a full CG effect, but since Fast Five's vault scene received so many accolades, Lynn decided to capture every car crushing moment in camera. The tank reveal specifically being one of Lynn and crew's biggest challenges and proudest accomplishments. Then there's the infamous plane sequence and that 30 mile long runway, which Lynn had already storyboarded during Fast Five. Sure, it pushed believability and physics, but was produced with such earnestness and visual prowess, it became the type of spectacle the franchise is now known for. Racing to meet the release date, Lynn, 12 VFX houses, and five editors had only three months to finish the film. Proving that Fast Five was not a fluke, Fast and Furious 6 landed May 24th, 2013, with an enormous 788 million worldwide take. 
Over the top in all the best ways, it may wear its soap opera melodrama on its sleeve, but one can't claim it isn't fun. The Fast and the Furious was here to stay. Universal had its cash cow franchise. Looking at their 2014 slate, they lacked a big summer blockbuster. They fast tracked seven while Lin was still editing six. He, Diesel, and Morgan had so many ideas, they knew exactly where seven would go. But Lin felt Universal's unreasonable timeline left him without a much needed break, and he wouldn't be able to deliver a quality product. The director of four back to back fast films bowed out. Fast and Furious had been such a big part of my career and my life. It was very emotional for me on many levels. And to be able to walk away, having it be my decision, that to me felt complete. It felt right. James Wan signed on, looking to make a break from his usual horror flicks. Little did he know he was about to embark on one of the most logistically difficult films ever made. At first, it was a pleasant surprise, seeing everyone collaborating in all aspects. Chris Morgan taking line ideas from Tyrese, or Walker wanting more action beats with Tony Jaa. And there was the airdrop sequence, which required months of preparation to figure out how to film real cars dropping out of a real military transport. It was a complicated mesh of multiple techniques, but Juan reveled in it. Then it got a bit more complicated. With Jason Statham joining, chosen by Facebook, of course, there were now three bald superstars vying for scene-stealing screen time. Each one of them had contracts protecting their egos. Oh, sorry, their brands. Every fight scene had to be calculated so that each actor lands the same amount of hits. And no clear winner can ever be established. Thing about street fights? The street always wins. A bump in the road, but doable. Three months in, the cast and crew parted for Thanksgiving break. Brian, are you okay? Mia, listen to me. Something's about to go down. And if you don't hear from me in 24 hours, I need you to take Jack and move on. This morning, sheriff's deputies in California are trying to learn what led to the death of a movie star. Actor Paul Walker was killed in a fiery car crash on Saturday. The accident scene tells the story. There it is. Walker was a passenger in a Porsche that collided with a pole and caught fire. The actor had been attending his charity event to benefit typhoon victims in the Philippines. And the driver, Walker's friend, Roger Rodas. Both pronounced dead at the scene following what was supposed to be a quick spin. Here's Walker with that Porsche in one of the last known videos of the 40-year-old star. And now this, a crash site turned into a memorial. Thank you for coming down there and, and, and showing that angel up in heaven how much you appreciate it reason why we all were devastated about Paul Walker is because he's the nicest dude on human feet. Paul had real relationships with everybody. You felt his love. You felt his spirit. You felt his energy. You felt the morale, the camaraderie, the inclusion. The relationships in that franchise are so strong and the brotherhood so real that it transcends the experience of making the movie. And you spend 15 years going from being a nobody to somebody with a brother. And then one day he's gone. While the Fast family mourned, Universal, Juan, and Chris Morgan spent weeks debating how to proceed. Juan had about 50% of the movie shot and they poured through every inch of footage, including bloopers and behind the scenes B-roll, to see if the film was salvageable. Ultimately, they wanted to finish it, for Paul, for the cast and crew's closure, to give his character the conclusion fans feared they would never have. Morgan reshaped Brian's arc, allowing him a gracious exit. Then Diesel announced that filming would resume in April, and with the help of CG and Walker's brothers, Cody and Caleb, Brian O'Connor would indeed ride into the sunset. Returning to set was obviously heartbreaking. For Jordana Brewster, it was agonizing, especially recording her unchanged lines for the film's most eerily touching scene. We're gonna have another baby. 
It's a little girl. <laughs> and she's going to need her father, so you have to finish what you're doing, and you have to come home to her. You have to come home to us. Vin Diesel, on the other hand, had a complete meltdown. He became increasingly difficult to work with, spending hours, sometimes days, in his trailer. He called the whole ordeal an awkward and uncomfortable process of pixels over people. It forced James Wan to consistently use Diesel's body doubles to finish scenes. When he did show up, he was compelled to do right by his spiritual brother. However, he severely overstepped his role as producer, questioning every one of Wan's decisions, down to insignificant details and would run late night script revisions, holding up all of production. If rallying the cast and crew each day wasn't heart wrenching enough, Juan was also grappling with the most technically troublesome obstacle in film history, the uncanny valley. Digital humans indistinguishable from reality have been a goal that no one has been able to overcome then or since. And Fast 7 needed a fully recreated Paul Walker for 260 shots. Universal invested an extra 50 million and hired Weta Digital to make it happen. For the on-set performance, Weta used the likeness of Walker's brothers, as well as the build of actor John Brotherton. They also combined archival audio of Walker with his brother's vocals to fill in Brian's lines. While the end result had many pointing out noticeable scenes, there were a hundred more no one caught. It was groundbreaking and emotional. There really wasn't room to let anything slip. It was too important to complete the story in respect to Paul's memory, to make sure that when you watched it, you didn't think about any of the work that we did. If you were a fan, you were watching Paul's performance and saying goodbye. Delayed nine months from its initial release date, Furious 7 arrived April 3rd, 2015. Fueled by an increased fandom, terrific reviews, and frankly, the morbidly curious, it became the fastest film to cross $1 billion, and the first film of Universal Pictures to do so, ending in a furiously high $1.5 billion. Again, the action was eye-rollingly awesome, but Furious 7 was surprisingly heartfelt. It was unanimously praised for its handling of the late Paul Walker which was elegant, respectful, and genuinely moving. Paul used to say that eight was guaranteed. In some ways, when, you're, when your brother guarantees something, you sometimes feel like you, you have to make sure it comes to pass. If fate has it, fate, F8, seven was for Paul, eight is from Paul. Even with Paul Walker's death and his character retired, Universal and Diesel saw at least three more films. For Fast 8, Justin Lin was busy shooting his dream project, Star Trek Beyond. Diesel suggested that they should bring back Rob Cohen, or Diesel himself should do it. Universal feared this above all else. Diesel would become unchained in his uncontrolling perfectionism, and they hastily offered James Wan a life-altering sum of money but no amount could make him forget how stepped on he felt and how taxing the entire ordeal was to his health. He decided to direct Conjuring 2 instead. Eventually, Universal hired F. Gary Gray. He was a solid choice, having worked previously with four of the stars, he was no stranger to action set pieces, and had also made another car heist film, the Italian Job remake. Gray learned quickly how fast these productions turn on a dime. When Helen Mirren said she'd love to be in the films, a week later, Diesel and Morgan had hurriedly rewrote the finished script to include her. So I would love to be in Fast and Furious. <laughs> You're not joking, are you serious? No, no, of course, there's incredible fun to do those movies, aren't they? I mean, they're, they're like, they're just, you don't act. <laughs> <laughs> Phew. <laughs> when the 60-year-old embargo on Cuba was lifted, Diesel and Universal swiftly applied for filming permits becoming the first blockbuster to shoot in the country since the 1960s. Day one of filming, a windstorm in Iceland threw an iceberg set piece into a nearby paddock, killing a horse named Jupiter. Despite the bad omen, production went smoothly, if you ignore the man beef. Diesel had been stewing about Dwayne Johnson boasting about being franchise Viagra. Franchise Viagra. Oh, franchise yeah. Viagra. Get your movie boner. 
Ballers up. And he took a joke from HBO's Ballers a little too seriously. Are you Vin Diesel? No, I'm bigger and better looking. So when Johnson started making a habit of showing up late to set, Diesel threw the first stone in his glass house, calling out Johnson's work ethic. Big mistake. The feud got so heated, Diesel and Johnson actually never filmed a single scene together on Fast 8. A week left in filming, Johnson posted on Instagram that some of his male co-stars were chicken shit candy asses. The vagueness of Johnson's statement made the last week tense and awkward, as it seemed like it was more than just Diesel that got under his hood. Diesel has been on the defense since, saying he was protecting Johnson from who knows what, and tossed it off as being tough on Johnson to deliver a hard-hitting performance. And it was just two alphas who didn't see eye to eye. The fate of the Furious broke through on April 14th, 2017. Still bonkers, still lovably nonsensical, but reviews took a sharp dive from Seven, and it was the first since Tokyo Drift to not break even domestically. Luckily for Universal, international audiences alone fueled it past 1 billion, but the US numbers scared Universal into thinking that franchise fatigue may have set in. In response, they switched gears by delaying Fast 9 a full year to accelerate a spin-off. The whole Fast team had been teasing spin-offs for a while, but once Universal saw the dailies of Johnson and Statham's verbal sparring, they put Hobbs and Shaw in the Fast lane. In doing so, Fast 9 would proceed without the two heavy hitters and Chris Morgan. Tyrese blew a gasket. Publicly ranting on social media, he called out The Rock for breaking up the family to further his own self-interests, ending in an ultimatum to the producers, The Rock or Tyrese. Dwayne Johnson is not in Fast 9. But like with all families, time heals all wounds. And if it's one thing the Fast Saga likes to remind us, like a lot, it's that it's always about family. Sure, it's corny as hell, but it represents Vin Diesel's ideal world of multiculturalism. Where it doesn't matter where you're from, it doesn't matter what nationality you are. If you love someone, they're your family. Families grow, they part, they love, they fight, they forgive. And fans love it. It's why the series is so beloved worldwide. It represents all of us and our shared passion for fast things going boom. See, it's legitimately the most inclusive Hollywood franchise. It's no wonder Universal geared F9's release as a global event, a celebration of a return to normal. After a year and a half of loss, solitude, and waiting, it's finally time for families to come together again. Justin Lin is back behind the wheel for F9 and giving fans justice for Han. The Rock, Diesel, and Tyrese have all since apologized. It's time for us all to move right along. We are truly birds of a feather. We're in this together. And we know where we're going. Movie stars with flashy cars and life with the top down. We're storming the big film. Yeah, storm is right. Should it be snowing? Uh, no, I don't think so. Moving right along. Do I see signs of men? Yeah, welcome on the same post that says come back again. Moving right along.